So let's start from the quote from Stephen Hawking. Hawking says, even if there is only one possible unified theory, it is just a set of rules and equations. What is it that breathes fire into the equations and makes a universe for them to describe? So this phrase, breathing fire into the equations, is very memorable. And Bear Lower in a paper of uh, the same title, actually, what breathes fire into the equations says, while physicists have been busy proposing, elaborating, and testing systems of laws, scientifically minded philosophers have engaged in discussions and disputes about the metaphysics of laws. The metaphysical question is, in virtue of what does generalization or an equation express a law? Let's think about some paradigm examples of candidate fundamental laws of physics. Let's call this list number one. So three examples, Newton's laws of motion, F equals MA, the Schrodinger equation, time evolution of the wave function, the Dirac equation, relativistic case, these three equations are paradigm cases of dynamical laws, but also for a particular form. They are laws of temporal evolution. They tell us, given the state of the universe at one time, say T1, how to derive the state of the universe at a different time, say T2. So state of universe evolving by the law of nature to state of the universe at a different time. So laws of temporal evolution. Now think about other examples called this list number two. The list number two contains some perhaps controversial examples of kinetic laws of physics. Well, not all of them controversial, but some of them are controversial. The first is the Einstein equation of general relativity. The second is the willy dewitt equation of quantum gravity. Third, conservation laws. Fourth, symmetry principles, the principle of least action, and the past hypothesis of a low entropy boundary condition of the universe. And consider equations motion for will refinement which are dynamics of direct interactions. Do this have the right form to be fundamental laws? Well, it's controversial. It relates to one's view about the metaphysics of laws and time. Our goal in this paper and in this talk is to articulate minimal primitivism about laws of nature, or mean P, for short, minimal primitivism, a minimalist and primitivist view about laws. I want to contrast this with some alternatives in literature. Our focus will be on laws of physics. So we don't talk about laws of biology, laws of chemistry. And we focus particularly on those suitable for being fundamental laws of physics, fundamental laws of nature, the real laws. Okay, by the way, we're gonna use the phrase fundamental laws and laws interchangeably in this talk, unless noted otherwise. And it's a very complicated topic, it's huge, with a vast literature, so we have to be selective and need to simplify. And for more details in the paper version with more caveats, footnotes, and clarifications. And uh, to give you more context of this talk and the spirit of this paper, let me um, say a few more personal um, notes. So I did my PhD at Rutgers. As you know, there are humians and non-humians um, teaching at Rutgers. And I studied with both humians, non-humians, and both phys physicists and philosophers. One thing I learned was that laws is a very central notion, but there's always more to this notion of laws, all the debate and nuances and contrasting viewpoints. So sometimes we start from our deeply held convictions and try to develop our views by responding to attacks and criticisms. At the end of the day, which package of views we hold on to or develop or endorse depends on careful cost-benefit analysis. So it's not gonna be a, a decisive argument or <laughs> refutation of the views. So my view of laws coming to mean P is the result of a reflective equilibrium. It happens to largely overlap with Shelley's viewpoint too. And um, as you will see, I'm very much influenced by Shelley's way of thinking. Um, and we think that this viewpoint is very much similar to many physicists view, and people who work in mathematical physics have similar views to mean P. So we want to articulate this view. So this paper is our joint effort of working out the consequences of our views. And on some core issues we feel very strongly, on other issues we feel um, not prepared to give a complete answer yet. 
So we merely list some options of those cases and leave many as open questions. One example is the probabilistic rules, which we talk about in the paper, but not focus on. Okay. Min P captures our conviction that the universe is governed by laws of nature in a way that does not presuppose a fundamental direction of time. And Min P is explicitly designed to be flexible about the forms of the laws. Now in the philosophy literature and perhaps in many people's minds, the two theses are tightly connected. The one is the governing conception of laws. Whether a human or non-human, governing or non-governing person, you might think that um, for laws to really govern in a metaphysical robust sense, it is governed in this particular way, in a time asymmetric way, time directed way, that presupposes a fundamental direction of time, or a fundamental distance between past and future. For laws to really govern the world, governing, right? They must produce later states of the universe from earlier ones in accord with a fundamental direction of time. So you see this in many places, but it was made explicit by T. Maudlin's book, The Metaphysics Within Physics, it's just chapter one and six. Discussed at length by uh, human critic, Bear Lower in two accounts of laws and time. We might call this picture time directed governing. And when we talk with other philosophers, we see that it's quite a common view. So not just put it to, uh, particular to Tim's view, but many people would endorse something like this. So first of all, laws are not merely summaries of what actually happens. We agree. But it goes beyond that. The time directedness says laws really govern, but via time asymmetric sense of dynamic production. So the state of universe at one time produces the state of universe another time and subsequent times and so on. Production, produce. It's almost like causation, but it's not quite the same as causation. Okay, so this presupposes a fundamental duration of time. This notion of dynamic production is very important for the metaphysics and explanation of time direct governing. Is it intuitive? Well, on the face of it, it seems to be intuitive. It seems like we talk, we feel this sense of time is passing, um, things being made, um, but we shall see it's not exactly intuitive. We think about relativity, we think about uh, the relata of production. And this sense of time rate governing, although it's governing, um, it might also be attractive to people who don't like the governing laws and who are not humans. So the Aristotelian reductionists, people who like these positions, might endorse something like time directedness too. Okay, and they might endorse the end production as we shall see in later quotes from Heather Demarest. <clears throat> so this notion of time directed governing puts restriction on the form of laws. It seems to focus on or allow only dynamical laws in a narrow sense, namely fundamental laws of temporal evolution or floats in Maudlin's memorable terminology, fundamental laws of temporal evolution are the only possible candidate for fundamental laws of nature. Dirac equation, Schrodinger equation, F equals MA, things like that. But not perhaps the Einstein equation, the past hypothesis, conservation laws, and so on. Now, are flows for this notion of dynamic production really compatible with the block universe? Think about block universe as a static, or in some sense, static block of all the events past, present, and the future. Can we really understand what is it producing something? Well, I think there's gonna be difficulties or at least kind of intuitiveness here. So we'll come to this later. Okay. So our motivation in this talk and this paper is to reflect upon the variety of kinds of laws physicists present as fundamental. List number eight one and list number two, all of them. Many, do, many of them do not have the form of floats. Say so the Einstein equation is not a paradigm case of float. Even for floats, that in production is not essential to how they govern or how they explain. Even for F because MA, it's not so clear they're really producing things in a block universe or producing things from one slice to another slice. Okay. 
So minimal primitivism, our view, min p, um, breaks the link between the governing conception and dynamic production. On our view, fundamental laws of nature govern by constraining the physical possibilities of the entire space-time and its contents. For simplicity, we talk about space-time, but MIMP is compatible with the view in which time is not fundamental, space is not fundamental, but more emergent. What's crucial is the notion of physical possibilities, whatever arena it is, civilizational arena, or topological arena, or something more general. So uh, MIMP, fundamental laws are not exclusively dynamical laws in the narrow sense of flows. They can take on other forms, global constraints, boundary condition constraints, and so on. MIMP is compatible with the universe being in a, in a temporal world, which time is not fundamental or not real, a block universe, not a growing block or shrinking block, a block universe, static and a block universe, is compatible with also temporal loops, closed time and loops in general relativity. Whereas um, it doesn't seem to be compatible with say, uh, Mount Lane's view or other views of governing. So MIMP captures the essence, the core, the absolute essential of the governing view. Without taking on, without taking on extraneous commitments about the duration of time, the net production. So it's kind of bare minimum of governing. We think it's enough, sufficient, and all of the core um, ideas of governing. Okay. So MIMP is a version of primitivism about laws of nature on which laws are not reducible to you when analyzable in terms of anything else. And MIMP is designed to be flexible, to allow floats, to allow principle of this action to be laws, to allow the equation of general relativity to be fundamental laws, the path of how to be a law, will define into dynamics, which are causal quantum mechanics, and so on. All of this can be fundamental laws. Okay. Now let's start with a brief survey of other views before coming to MIMP. Four views, human reductionism of Lewis and others, platonic reductionism of Armstrong, Tooley, and Dresky, Aristotelian reductionism, Bird, Ellis, Demarest, um, uh, others, Malinian primitivism, so Tim Malin's view, before coming to MIMP. First view, human reductionism. So some of you are familiar with this view, but if survey here, so on this view, ultimately, there are no laws. So what you have at the fundamental level is what's called a human mosaic. The space-time and a decoration of space-time with stuff, right? Objects, you and me, and particles and fields. But at the bottom level reality, nothing's really enforcing the patterns. Nothing is really causing the patterns. Nothing's really producing the patterns. Nothing's really constraining the patterns. On this sense, uh, on this view, uh, laws, say L, are metaphysically derivative. So laws are going to be um, derived from, um, dependent on the, uh, the mosaic, the human mosaic. And uh, in particular, laws are merely efficient summaries of the human mosaic, balancing various virtues of simplicity, uh, informativeness, fit, and so on, naturalness. But the human mosaic was fundamental is whatever it happens to be. No reason is deeper than the mosaic itself. On this view, you can have a reductionist view by direction of time in which time's arrow is not fundamental either, but depends on the distribution of matter um, that give rise to the entropy gradient and arrow of time. So this view is compatible with a reduction about arrow of time. Okay. It's a very minimalist view, right? Perhaps more minimalist than MIMP. <laughs> The second view is platonic reductionism. So it was people's views like Armstrong, Tooley, and Dresky. This view postulates universals, which are repeatable entities. They explain the general similarity of material objects. And universals exist over and above human mosaic. So for example, being a cup is a universal that can be essentially many objects, uh, cups but it is something they have in common. Now think about the example that every mass particle obeys a law at equals ma. So in this case, you can think that there are universals 
real abstract properties, universals, having mass m beyond total force f and having acceleration f equals m over m. And this give unity among the particles. So the many particles, distinct particles, can share the same universals. So Alice and Bob, two particles can share the same universal, be having mass m and so on. So this gives you a unified explanation in the sense that the universal having mass m and the universal being on the total force f necessitate the universal having acceleration f over m. So in this sense, we have a unified kind of explanation that every particle has to obey f equals ma. So this view perhaps is best paired with a fundamental direction of time because it doesn't seem to uh, allow for reduction of time error into say the path hypothesis. And since that is very um, linked to causal fundamentalism, at least was in uh, Thule's case. Okay. Perhaps it's not quite um, incompatible with times error being non-fundamental, but we'll come to this later. Okay, the third view, which we call Aristotelian reductionism. So this view um, shares with a human core, that is ultimately there are no laws, but it's not a human mosaic, the static. Um, it's not a kind of a passive uh, mosaic. But on this view, the fundamental ontology is one, a world that is active and reactive in Alice's words. There are fundamental dispositions, sometimes called powers, capacities, potentialities, and potencies. What are they? Well, it's not quite analyzed something further, but if you give examples, a glass has its disposition to shatter when struck, negative charged particles, have disposition to attract positive charged particles, and so on. The dispositions are fundamental, or the potencies are fundamental. They are where the powers reside. So Bird summarizes this view. According to this view, laws are not thrust upon properties, irrespective, as it were, of what those properties are. Rather, the laws spring from within the properties themselves. So the laws are, are given, given rise to from the properties things have. But they're not like universals, inert. They are powerful things. They are active properties in some sense. So on this view, the metaphysical powers, necessity, and oomph reside in not laws, but in the fundamental dispositions, powers. And laws are metaphysical derivative of these dispositions. And because of this, laws are metaphysically necessary. So the laws cannot fail to hold in any possible world. Okay, regarding explanation, uh, there's a very interesting quote from Demarest. So Demarest says, I think the most promising solution to how we think about explanation in this account is to appeal to production, dynamic, metaphysical dependence. So even though on her view, laws are not fundamental, she still thinks that explanation occurs by production, producing things in time. According to my view, the fundamental ground includes space-time and an initial arrangement of particles and potencies, dispositions, and the subsequent behavior of the particles where further potency instantiation as well as trajectory through space-time is dynamically metaphysically dependent on that base. So for her, even laws are not governing, still she thinks that dynamic production is um, how um, powers explain. You can see this also from dispositions ontology itself. For dispositions, they have manifestation conditions and stimuli conditions. The stimuli are temporally prior to manifestations of these dispositions. So in that sense, um, there's already this time dependence, time asymmetry built in, being how we characterize dispositions. So they seem to be committed to a fundamental direction of time twice over on this account. Okay. The fourth view. And the final one before coming to mean P. So this is from um, Tim Modeling's book, The Metaphysical in Physics. So Modeling's view is very close to ours, but there's one crucial difference. So Modeling says, my analysis of laws is no analysis at all. It's primitivist. Rather, I suggest that we accept laws as fundamental entities in ontology. We're speaking at a conceptual level, the notion of a law cannot be reduced to any other more primitive notions. This primitivism about laws 
And the motivation here, I think, is quite clear and very plausible that in scientific practice, in science, we start from laws, we end with laws, we try to use laws to explain, we don't want to reduce them further to mosaic or dispositions or universals. And philosophers can follow the lead of scientists and not try to reduce them further. But laws are still fundamental here. So Maudlin's view commits something else beyond primitivism. So Maudlin says in the uh, uh, final chapter, the whole ball of wax, he says, let's call the idea that both the laws of physics as laws of temporal evolution floats and the duration of time are ontological primitives, Maudlin's non-human package. According to this package, the total state of the universe is in a certain sense derivative. It is a product of the operational laws on the initial state. The given initial state T0, we derived the state T1, T2, and so on. All the subsequent states are derived from the initial state at the operational laws. But you see that modeling technique comes to both primitivism about laws of nature and primitives about duration of time. Both are essential. They intertwined to give you the interweave picture of dynamic production. Laws produced to generate the state of the world from earlier ones. And for him, I think the initial state, at least in the um, in the book seems quite uh, important, right? So here they give us the product explanation. So via product power of the laws, subsequent states of the world and its parts are explained by earlier ones and ultimately by the initial state of the universe. Production is close related to causation. And just like paradigm cases of causation, it is time asymmetric. So one slice causes the other slice or produces the other slice, but not vice versa. One attraction Bontlin notes is that it is closer to the intuitive picture of the world we start over with. We think in our experience, time seems to pass. There seems to be a duration of time. And so um, it seems intuitive that time's arrow is fundamental. Okay, let's call this view Maudlin and primitivism. Fundamental laws are certain ontological primitives in the world. Now, the second restriction is that dynamical laws only, only dynamical laws can be fundamental laws in the narrow sense of laws of temporal evolution, be fundamental laws. They operate on the universe by producing the later states of the universe and earlier ones in accord with the fundamental direction of time. So on this view, there's a restriction to floats. When you have a block universe, talking in terms of production seems less natural. Relativity especially give you um, more reason to pause that there's no absolute simultaneity, absolute now, the present. So what is it to be producing things forward? Is it something producing from the present moment or producing from a temporally? And moreover, what is the first moment in time doing in this picture? Does it assume that there has to be the absolute beginning of the universe? Is it compatible with multiple beginnings or eternal universes? And what is relata? Dynamic production. Even for say F equals MA, we need both position and momentum data. And momentum is not confined to one slice of time. So it's not really one slice produces another slice, but something like a chunk of time produces another chunk of time. So it may not be quite intuitive when you think about the details. Okay. Let's come to minimal primitivism, mean P. So here's the mental imagery I like to use for mean P. It's minimalist picture. And second, it's like invoking the picture of the block universe without fundamental arrow of time. That's kind of permeating the block. So no fundamental arrows, just one block. And laws constrain this block from the outside. Okay. So on our view, minimal primitivism, there are two theses, a metaphysical one and an epistemic one. So the first thesis, is fundamental laws of nature are certain primitive facts about the world. So on this, we agree roughly with Tim Mullins' view. But the second one is relaxation. There is no restriction on the form of the fundamental laws. They govern the behavior of material objects by constraining the physical possibilities. So primitivism about laws of nature, but does not require primitivism about the duration of time. The two are separate. 
Now, even though there is no metaphysical restriction on the form of laws, it is rational to expect them to have certain nice features. Simplicity, informativeness, naturalness, uni unification, and so on and so forth. Uh, now, on human reductionism, those features are metaphysically constitutive of what laws are. On our view, however, they are merely epistemic guides, methodological gu guides for discovering and evaluating the laws. This might give us preference for, say, floats over constraint laws or floats over boundary condition laws, but only preference, not absolute prohibition about any form of laws. Okay. So even though the radio virtues um, are not metaphysical of fundamental laws, they're good epistemic guides for discovering and evaluating them. Okay. Let me clarify a few things here. So first, primitive facts. On our view, fundamental laws of nature are certain primitive facts about the world in the sense that they're not metaphysically dependent on or reducible to analyze in terms of anything else. So primitivism. What is this governing relation between the law L and the world say, call this M. Laws govern by limiting the physical possibilities and constraining the physical world, the actual world history to be one of them. The laws give us many possibilities, M1, M2, M3, M4, and so on. Maybe infinite list. And the content of governing says, the actual world M is a member of this set. It must belong to the set of models compatible with L. Now this notion constraint does not require a fundamental distinction between past and future, or one between earlier states and later ones. Well, the laws constrain this entire space-time and its contents. Again, space-time here is for simplicity, replacing place-time with your favorite notion of arena, say topological structure or, you know, um, quantum gravity structure in which there's no fundamental space and time. But on a simple level, just think about the space time is fundamental and what a law does is to constrain the entire space time and its contents. And sometimes the constraint can be expressed in terms of differential equations that permit a productive interpretation to produce things forward in time, sometimes not, right? Not all solution to Einstein equations can be expressed in terms of different equations. Now, for example, consider Hamilton's equations for motion, of n-point particles, Newtonian masses m1 to mn, moving three-dimensional Euclidean space with position, momentum, by two equations. The one equation, the law of motion. The second equation specify what h is, Hamiltonian function of the Newtonian gravitation. Simple case, toy model. Two equations. Now, our mean p saying that one and two govern our world means that one and two express fundamental facts that constrain particle trajectories in space-time. So how particles move must obey one and two. In tight trajectories, there's no need to invoke dynamic production. Talk about in tight trajectories on the whole space-time. Let omega h denote the set of solution to one and two, say this set solution to one and two, say in phase space. Um, right. So in phase space, you have some uh, trajectories compatible with one and two. So the content constraining is that the trajectory, the uh, configuration uh, or the, um, the phase point trajectory must be one of those allowed by the two equations. In this example, the dynamical equations are time reversible. And it's very crucial. So for every solution in omega h, is time reversal on the t to minus t and p to minus p is also a solution in omega h. Now our mean p is permissible that two solutions that are time reversal of each other can be identified as the same physical possibility. So this one and this one can be identified as the same possibility. There's no fundamental error of time here. Okay. Now, we should not think of the law as necessarily equivalent to a set of possibilities and generates. So the two equations one and two, simple equations, are not necessarily equivalent to the set of solutions they're compatible with, 
the omega h. The two can be different. There are many different principles and equations that can give rise to the same set of possibilities denoted by omega h. Given epistemic guides, we expect loss to be simple. One way to pick out the set omega h is by giving a complete and infinitely long list of possible histories compatible with uh, in containing omega h. It's very complicated, very messy. Another way is by writing down simple equations, such as one and two, which express simple laws. So on this account, the equivalence of physical laws is not just the equivalence of their classes of models. The two can be different. For two laws to be equivalent, we require something more. When what exactly do we need? We don't say this more in this paper, in this talk. Leave open question of future research. Now let me clarify on the governing relation again. So Helen Beebe raised this objection to the governing conception that governing seems to be a mystery. The notion of governing, how laws govern the world, seems derived from the notion of government, the notion of being governed in human sense. The laws of nature are obviously not imposed by human or divine agents. So it's not mysterious that laws can govern. Reply, a better analogy here on um, or in governing conception is not to human government, but to laws of mathematics and logic. Arithmetical laws, true, such as two plus three equals five, and logical truth as laws of the triple middle can also be said to constrain our world in the sense of imposing formal constraints. The actual world cannot violate those mathematical or logical truths. Every possible world must respect them. Similarly, the actual world cannot violate physical laws Every physically possible world must respect them. Now, no analogy is perfect, right? There are two differences here between mathematical and physical laws. Difference in epistemic access. We discover mathematical laws a priori without the need for experiments or observations. We discover physical laws a posteriori empirically. Second difference in scope. Mathematical laws are more general than physical laws in the sense the former are compatible with more models than the latter. So three speaking, physical laws compatible with some models, mathematical laws are compatible with more models. That includes physical laws, the model of physical laws is a proper subset. Still, it shows the notion of governing does not depend on governing by agents. So this at least responds to the mystery objection, The governing is a mystery. Our main key, Laws governed by constraining, and constraining is what they do. And this provides the oomph behind scientific explanations. Now, what oomph is, we'll come back to this later. However, this oomph does not require dynamic production, does not require an extra process supplied by a mechanism or an agent, human or divine. Let me come to epistemic access, which is a dedicated point, which I think is really interesting. So I'm writing a new paper on this topic. But on epistemic access, we say a few words in the paper version as well. We say that our main P, even though the human criteria for the best system are not metaphysically constitutive for lawhood, they nonetheless excellent epistemic guides for discovering and evaluating them. So David Lewis is right that in scientific practice, in the context of discovery, we do aim for balancing simplicity and informativeness among other things. Regarding epistemic guides, so my, on my ask us, on MIMP, in virtue of what those theoretical virtues are good for, a good guides for defining and evaluating the laws which are primitive facts in the world. So the issue, so unlike humans, we cannot appeal to reduction in terms of simplicity, right? By the way, what's a human story? It's not completely clear either. We have to assume something about the mosaic being nice for us to discover. Now, our main people can offer input justification, namely the scientific, scientific methodology works. It does. Insofar as those theoretical virtues are central to scientific methodology, they are good guides for discovering and evaluating laws, and we expect them to be continued to work. And this relates to the problem of induction. So if simplicity is a guide to laws, then this actually is deeper than 
um, uniformity of nature, and this solved the problem induction. Now, I don't think anyone can solve the problem induction without vacuum questions. So this is doesn't doesn't you know offer justification that's not circular, but still it is something that we have to assume or impose to get science going. Okay. Some other question concerning MIMP, I briefly mentioned it here without getting into details. According to MIMP, can laws change with time? Yes. They can govern different epochs in different ways. Can they refer to fundamental properties such as entropy? Yes. Um, how they distinguish from the fundamental laws and so on. How do laws explain? <clears throat> how does MIMP compare to other views? Let me come to these two other questions in the next few slides. Okay. So our MIMP laws explain but not by accounting for the dynamic production of successive states of the universe from earlier ones. They explain by expressing a hidden simplicity given by compelling constraints that lie beneath complex phenomena. So on our view, a fundamental expression of time is not required for our notion of scientific or normal explanation in physics. This relates to what's called constraint explanation in the works of Ben Minaheim and Mark Land's work. Now, it's not quite the same as theirs. Um, and I can talk more about differences later. Okay. So to explain, fundamental laws need not be time directed or time dependent. For example, uh, they can govern purely spatial distribution of matter. Gauss law that governs distribution, the distribution of charge densities and divergence of E, right? In classical relational dynamics, one of Maxwell's equations govern the Maxwellian world in some spatial sense, right? Without telling you how things evolve in time. And this is not a dynamic law or temporal evolution law. Often, the explanation we try to strive for or find um, that laws provide involves driving striking novel and unexpected patterns from simple laws. What's important is that there's a simple law that can derive complex phenomena patterns P. Okay, let me use one toy example. I think it's a beautiful example from um, the mathematics of fractal geometry. So here's a picture you might have seen on Wikipedia or on Google. So this is a very intricate, rich pattern on this two-dimensional picture. It's called a Mandelbrot set. Okay, so what's cool about this is that there's a um, big structure here, but whenever you zoom in, Whenever you zoom in to the subparts and zoom in again and zoom in again, you see patterns of the substructure resembling the parent structure. And zoom in again, again, resemblance. And zoom in in other places, still resembling the entire structure. But every time you zoom in, you find something different. You find surprises. You find some difference here and there. So it's not quite exact correspondence. It's like almost resemblance. So there's a rich pattern to be discovered here. If you're inhabiting this world, you can say, okay, what is generating this pattern? What is responsible for this? It turns out there's a simple rule. So consider Mandelbrot set in the complex plane produced by the simple rule, the complex number C is in the set. Just in case a function Z squared plus C does not diverge when you read from Z equals zero. So for example, C equals minus one is in the set, but C equals one is not because the sequence say from zero to um, zero minus one is minus one, minus one squared minus one is zero, minus one, zero minus one is bounded. So this is in the set, but this one, zero plus one is one, one squared plus one, two, two squared plus one is five and so on is unbounded. So this is not in the set. Do this for every number, you get this picture. There is a simple rule that generates the entire pattern. So a relatively simple rule yields a surprisingly intricate and rich pattern in the complex plane of fractal structure. Now regard the Mandelbrot set as corresponding to the distribution of matter over two-dimensional space-time. Place a particle wherever there's a dark point, a uh, you know, black spot. And don't place a particle when there is you know, uh, there's no black spot. So you have just distribution of particles in this space-time. Call this the Mandelbrot world. The fundamental law for this Mandelbrot world is given entirely by this rule based on equation four. Given just the pattern, 
we might not expect it to be generated by any simple rule. So if you are an inhabitant assigned in that world, you'd be profound discovery in that way to learn that its intricate structure is generated by the simple rule based on a very simple function. The patterns constrained by this fundamental law and strongly constrained in the sense that the fundamental law is compatible with only one possible model, this case of strong determinism, in the sense of Roger Penrose term strong determinism. So this law is a paradigm case of constraint. It constrains so much, there's only one possibility. Use everything else as impossible. In this case, there's a big contrast between the simplicity of the law, right? And the complexity rich in this pattern, the entire fractal structure. And yet this law is not dynamic law. It's not a temporal evolution law. There's not even a sense of foliation in this universe. There's not a sense of east and west in this universe. It is just a one space time altogether. The law constrained the space time is entirely altogether. On our view, laws explain by constraining the physical possibilities in an illuminating manner. By this, we mean that in some simple law, simple manner. Nomic explanations, those given by fundamental laws, need not be dynamic or productive explanations. Indeed, they need not involve time at all. Gauss law, right? Mendelbrot set, and so on. Explanation by striking constraint can especially illuminating when an intricate rich pattern can be derived from a simple rule that expresses the constraint imposed by a law. Okay, that's our view. Now, for us, there are seem to be two ingredients of scientific explanation that's successful, a metaphysical dimension and an epistemic one. First, it must relate to objective structure in the world, something really existing, fundamental. Second, it must relate to our mind, remove puzzlement, and provide an understanding of nature. On the first thing, this is something that non-humans agree on, maybe many, many of you share. We call this non-human precondition for an explanation. Laws must not be mere summaries of or supervenient on what actually happens. And moreover, laws should not depend on our actual practice or beliefs. They should mind independence, objectivity, and should non supervenience and fundamentality, or maybe at least non supervenient on mosaic. On MIMP, this condition is fulfilled by partially fundamental laws as primitive, metaphysically fundamental facts that constrain the world, that constrain provides the needed room behind the same explanations. And here lies the main difference between MIMP and human reductionism. And this is analogous to grounding explanation, although it's not the same, because grounding seems to imply necessitation, whereas MIMP laws L may um, constrain us that it only constrains possibilities, but does not necessitate the actual world alpha, except in the case of strong determinism. Second, second dimension, epistemic dimension. So we say this and probably agree with our human critique, um, that constraints in and of themselves do not always provide satisfying explanations. Many constraints, think of omega age or any arbitrary constraints, are complicated and thus insufficient for understanding nature. What we look for in science and physics, fundamental physics, is not just any constraint, but simple, compelling ones, the ground observed complexities of an often bewildering variety. And this corresponds to the insight realization that is to say, aha, now I understand what's going on. It's very summar this is very nice summarized by Penrose in his paper on applied mathematics. He says, um, it has to do with unexpected simplicity. Where one imagined that things are going to be very complicated and suddenly, but suddenly they turn to be very simple, but simpler than expected. It is not unnatural that they should be pleasing to the mind. So it's unexpected simplicity. Okay, and this illum illuminates our principle of epistemic guides. It is obvious that fundamental law should be empirically adequate and consistent with all phenomena. But you know, as Ben Frozen show and other people show, um, that empirical adequacy and consistency are pretty weak constraints, right? They don't really pin down the laws of nature that realists accept. Why should we expect laws to be simple? 
on our view, they can be partly answered by thinking about the nature of scientific nations. If successful scientific nations require simple laws, then laws should be simple enough to perform the explanatory role. One might press further and ask, why should laws perform such roles and why scientific explanation can be successful? But this can be asked for any question, any account of laws. So it's not particularly mean P. It's not just our problem. Now, to further illustrate our view, let's go through some examples. Dynamical laws, and then a constraint laws, and probabilistic laws. Dynamical laws. So we take dynamical law to be any law that determines how things move and how things change. So our notion that dynamical laws is wider than Martin's notion of floats. We've seen Hamiltonian equations. And also we have the principles of least action. Say Hamilton's principle of least action determines say, between two time t1 and t2, um, the trajectory of particles, right, um, obeys principle of least action, selecting one of them stationary action. This one might be a corollary or theorem of Hamiltonian equations, but it feels very different from dynamical law. On our view, this can be fundamental. This means that trajectory of space-time or particle trajectory in space-time have to be has to obey this law, has to be one satisfying this constraint. But this is not a float. Um, third, we'll define some dynamics. Think about the following law that says motion of particles at time, uh, some time t, um, at some point, space time point, depends on both future and past distribution of charges, retarded and advanced fields. So this view, again, is not a, a dynamical law in the sense of temporal evolution, but this can be a constraint law. It says every trajectory must satisfy this constraint. So I mean, P is very easy to satisfy to see why it is compatible. We also have virtual causal quantum mechanics. Uh, it's not our view, but still you might have this view. It's from Sutherland's paper in which um, the particle trajectory velocity depends on both uh, wave function from the future and from, from evolving from the past. Okay, so this is not a dynamical evolution law in the sense of temporal evolution, but still can be a, a constraint law um, okay. Moreover, the Einstein equation of general relativity is not temporal evolution law. It gives you the entire space time and possibilities. And it's compatible with, say, time, cosine time like loops and many conditions that don't satisfy um, you know, temporal evolution conditions, but this can be decomposed into ADM. On mean P, however, this need not be decomposed into Hamiltonian equations. This can be by itself a fundamental constraint. On the entire space time. Sorry, I'm going very fast here because my time is running out. <laughs> okay. There are also laws that don't satisfy any uh, dynamical for forms, including ones that have no time at all. So the past hypothesis is a condition on the boundary condition of the universe. It said at one temporal boundary universe at T0, say the universe is in a low entropy state. So there's no hope of thinking about this at the time of evolution law. And still this can be a constraint law on our view. Similarly, con conservation laws and symmetry principles can be fundamental constraint laws too. So if there's a symmetry principle K that constrains the law L, then both L and K for both the set of possibilities of L uh, must obey the constraint imposed by K. Okay. Probabilistic laws, um, are going to be more tricky. So we don't say a lot about this in the paper, or at least some open, question, open options. There are two types of probabilistic clustering in physics. One is stochastic dynamics, like in GRW, right? So you have uh, stochastic jumps of wave functions. So psi, um, psi zero, jump of psi t1, and psi t2, and so on. Also, we have probably boundary conditions that constraints the probability distribution of um, say t0. Now, um, our preference to think of probability in terms of typicality, um, in terms of what is typical, not in what's probable. Even the GRW theory can be understood as specifying typicality measure over histories of the quantum states. To tell us which histories of quantum states are typical. Right? Now, um, probability measures and typicality measure are not 
straightforwardly compatible or understandable in terms of mean p because it's not in terms of categorical constraints, what is physically possible, what is physically impossible. Typicality and probability can go beyond possibility and impossibility. And difficulty is greater for stochastic dynamics because what's stochastic is really nomological, it's not like under conditions. But the difficulty here is common to all non-human accounts, to Maudlin's, to Armstrong's, uh, to other accounts of non-human uh, governing conception of laws. It might be uh, the case it's not a problem at all on humanism, if we set aside the problem of non-governing. So we think of probability distribution are just summaries in addition to dynamical laws of the human mosaic. So we list some options in the paper. Um, I won't go through them right now, but to suffice to say today that there are many difficult questions here about probabilistic laws. Um, okay, to briefly compare before coming to an end, mean p is a minimalist version of the non humanism of laws of nature, naturally accommodates diverse kinds of laws in the same physics. We turn to some differences between mean p and alternatives. So, comparison with human reductionism. So, we agree with humans that laws um, can describe or explain without presupposing the fundamental error of time. But we disagree on what is the ultimate explanation. For humans, they think that what's fundamental is the human mosaic and, and laws explain in terms of the mosaic. For us is the mosaic, the pattern of the mosaic explained in part by the laws of nature. For us, both the mosaic and the laws are fundamental. And we endorse non supervenience. There can be um, two mosaics compatible with say, the same mosaic M and M to M in world one and world two, but governed by different laws, L1 and L2. It's one very crucial non-human intuition, non-supervenience. And because of fundamentality of laws, they are whatever they are, uh, the laws are fundamental and objective in our view and mind independent. But on some human views, the laws are in part uh, constitute about our values or judgments of simplicity and so on. Okay. In comparison with Platonic reductionism, so views in uh, postulating fundamental universals, so we don't postulate fundamental universals. So we can be complete nominalist about properties and so on. And we don't place restriction in the form of laws. We can have uh, particular facts be laws, the non universal properties. Um, and there's a question whether Platonic reductionism is fundamental, compatible with a non fundamental error of time. We think we, um, our view is, but it's not clear whether Platonic reductionism is. In comparison with the power disposition view. So we don't think there are fundamental dispositions. At any rate, we don't require them to, to exist in the fundamental world. Um, so this view, however, is in reductionism assume there are fundamental dispositions or powers in ontology. Because of this, there are some problems specific to analyzing laws in terms of dispositions. Say constants of nature, conservation laws, symmetry principles, principle of least action, and other laws in the same different properties. We discuss in birds, Worked on, uh, worked on dispositions. So this problems just disappear on main P. They don't even arise on main P. And um, some dispositionalists like Demarest and others seem to commit to a dynamic production picture of explanation. And they seem to commit to a fundamental version of time, but we don't. Okay. Lastly, comparison with Maltlinian primitivism. So we agree with Maltlin on a set of laws we agree that laws are fundamental primitive facts. We disagree on the status of the direction of time, the form of laws, and the status of knowing explanation. So mean P is not committed to fundamental direction of time. And for us, then in production is not essential to how laws govern or how laws explain. Okay. Let me end with a brief summary. Mean P is, we think, an intelligible and attractive proposal for understanding laws of nature fundamental laws of nature. It vindicates non-human conviction, the core of the human conviction, the laws govern. It is flexible enough to accommodate the variety of kinds of laws entertaining in physics. In particular, it does not require that laws presume a fundamental direction of time. So we think that mean P illuminates metaphysics, but it's not unduly constrained by it. Okay, the paper version is on archive and uh, we thank you for your attention, the end. So let's start with Diego. 
Hi, Eddie. Uh, Hi, Diego. Thanks for the talk. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I have a like a, a couple of questions. Uh, so first, uh, so there's there's like an analogy that you made with uh, mat mathematics and physics uh, to explain how loss constraint. Um, I wonder what you would say to someone who thinks that uh, mathematic uh, mathematics and logic. I'm sorry. So uh, you made an analogy with mathematics and logic. Uh, I wonder what you would say to someone who thinks that uh, mathematics and logic doesn't constrain doesn't constrain the world at all. Uh, and th there are some views on that, like camp. There are people who think that uh, mathematical equations are trivially true. So there's no sense in which they constrain the world because the world doesn't have to do anything for them to be true. Uh, uh, may, maybe that's not like part of your view, but uh, so if someone does, if someone doesn't think that like logic and mathematics constrain, how should that person think about like loss in, in or yeah. if there's like another analogy? Um, right. Yeah, yeah Shona, do you want to go first? <laughs> no, I'll just say something very brief and then I'll let you answer. You're quite right, Diego, for such a person, this analogy with mathematics and logic is not going to be very useful. Um, Eddie, what's a good example analogy for such a person? <laughs> uh, I'm not sure. <laughs> I mean, uh, there are some people who do like philosophy of mathematics who right, like yeah. think think that like th they say like oh for mathematical yeah uh, trivialism right yeah they're yeah yeah um, I, I think um right so no analogy is perfect there may be other analogies but for them um do they think there are any formal constraint on the world beyond physical necessities if so they can think of physical necess necessities constraining the world is similar with those formal constraints maybe not mathematical constraints maybe logical constraints um and they might call it trivial in the sense that um, every possible will satisfy them. So there's nothing to discover about them empirically. Uh, that we agree. <laughs> the point of um, the uh, uh, analogy is to say that governing is not quite a mystery. We can think of governing analogous to how formal constraints govern in general. Okay, uh, do we have a follow-up, Diego? Uh, I, I have another question, but I'm probably going to go back to the queue because it's not related. That's fine. Thank you very much. Oh, just one more thing. Sorry. Yeah. So, Diego, you know, I'm um, sympathetic somewhat to a more deflationist view of mathematics. So my own view is that if you do that work, you have to be committed to some kind of constraint, like logical constraint. So logical necessity is the bottom line, even for mathematical deflationists. Right. So then you can make the same analogy. Okay, thanks. Next in line, we have Giuliano. Okay, thanks. Uh, thanks for the talk, Edley. It was very, very interesting. Um, yes, I was wondering whether, uh, so you can say, we can, you can say something more about, uh, I mean, you said a lot about the, the, the issue of uh, simplicity and, and uh, uh, explanatoriness, uh, mm -hmm. uh, but I was wondering, uh, so, um, so let me put it this way: in the, you know, almost everyone in the debate can say something like, "Oh, you know, this is the scientific practice." Okay, this is you know, this is all what sci scientists do. You know, they 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 use this as a guidance for finding out laws, uh, and 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 so that's it, right? Uh, and uh, but then you know, when it comes to uh, the part of the philosophical position, or you know, the union can say like. Uh, well, yes, there's nothing more to, to this. You no, know, just like the laws are, are you know, have these properties because uh, uh, they inherited from the scientific practice, uh, and uh, the, you know, the, the, the both the Aristotelian and the Platonic reductionists can say, well, you know, this is a scientific practice, but now we come metaphysician, we tell you what is the nature of the things that that makes it the case that uh, the laws that the the, the scientists that find out. Uh, 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 explain and things like that, but I have difficulty in understanding what 
what you can say here you know, because it looks like that uh, you have to say oh you know these two properties of the law are really the, the two things that uh, are are the properties of the two fundamental uh, oh, sorry two properties or anyway the, the theoretical virtues you know, really capture the properties of the thing that is fundamental for us uh, namely the law because they're primitive and uh, this seems a bit uh, i mean had the I don't know if you feel the the the, the my, my my problem. So it's like a, it seems like there's no there's no explanation of, for this. So maybe the the the, the reductionist, the Platonist reductionist, and the and the Aristotelian reduction have an explanation which is bad or can be criticized. But there is some sort of explanation there. Uh, I have the impression that you take this as just a brute fact, and uh, uh, um, and that's like uh, uh, yeah, that's my question. Sorry. <laughs> Juliana, is the question about the simplicity constraint or um, that simplicity and formulas are a guide for discovering laws, or is it? Yeah, no, exactly. So why, why, why should be simplicity uh, a guide, uh, an epistemic guide to, to the laws, given that the laws for you are the fundamental stuff and not? Uh, so one can say, oh, the, the, it's an epistemic guide to the laws because this is scientific practice. Fine, but that's fine for all the other views. For your views, is a bit more difficult to say that. I feel, I think, because uh, uh, you you want to say that uh, uh, you know this uh, uh, this epistemic guide uh, uh, is a guide actually to your metaphysical theory, uh, and I think it's the same problem for everyone. That's why I'm writing a new paper on simplicity physical laws, um, mm -hmm. showing in each case, even for humans they have to posit something independent, fundamental about simplicity of the mosaic to get induction going, to get um, science going. For the platonic reductionists, they have to posit that the construction function or the combination of universals are written in simple ways, um, such that they allow this temporal variation, this bizarre and wild variation in time or space. So everyone needs to posit something about simplicity to the fundamental ontology, or simplicity of a guide to discover the fundamental ontology. Um, for us, it is uh, the same guide, and we think that there's motivation to do so on our view of explanation, right? Um, um, but insofar as it is a fundamental posit, it is everyone's posit. Uh, Michelle, do you want to add to this? Well, you know, just as a methodological or epistemic, maybe, I'm, I'm, nobody is going to believe a proposed law if it doesn't have a sufficient sim simplicity. Why that is, who knows, but it's certainly the case. Laws to be believable, to work on human beings as, and, and seem successful, they have to produce some sort of um, aha moment. Now, if they don't produce that aha moment, it's not because what's been produced doesn't meet the requirements for what it means to be a law, but it certainly doesn't meet the requirements for human beings to accept it as a law. And we have that, that's certainly going to be relevant if we under, want to understand why laws end up having the form they do for human beings. Yeah. The different way to think about this, Juliana, is it's a kind of Quinean web of belief thing. That as realists, we accept laws uh, having this kind of roles to play in scientific methodology and also explanation. And um, what are some criteria we have for laws? And what are some assumptions we have to make about laws? One of them is that simplicity is probably a good guide for discovering laws, even though we have no proof or there's no a prior justification for why it is the case. Um, but um, as you can probably imagine, even for universal accounts or disposition account of laws or human kind of law, there has to be some independent sum of simplicity somewhere in the theory. Otherwise, the theory can solve the problem induction without back any question. That just can't be the case. Yeah, I see that. But well, anyway, maybe I should should talk. But uh, I mean, like, if you have a quick follow up. Uh, okay, you were, I just agree for, <laughs> so, no, no, I, I see that. Uh, but but so my point is that uh, so one thing to say, uh, uh, so you, you need uh, you need this constraint to discover laws, and 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 the other thing is say so once you have the, the once you have discovered the laws, 
uh, then you, you, you take, uh, you know, you, you, you consider a lot the, the loss with this property that they have uh, as uh, fundamental. So in, in the case of, of the of the of uh, of the modeling, you no, know, you version, you no, know, you have uh, 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 you don't have the whole thing, okay? So you <laughs> you don't have the as you said, you know, it's, it's just like uh, there is this production uh, uh, element. Uh, so the, the laws, so the science scientific practice let us discover the law, uh, and then we have a metaphysical theory that says that. Uh, uh, you know, each state of, of the world, you know, because in virtue of the laws being what they are, produce the next one. Fine. Uh, but you say, like, no, there is the whole space time. There is a constraint, and this constraint uh, is given by this substantive uh, thing, which, which are the laws, uh, and the laws have these properties. Uh, and <laughs> so it's, it's like uh, the, so in your theory, the simplicity. Uh, constraint makes a lot of work in a way, and uh, and it's like that has no other justification that the practice is is like that. Uh, whereas in other theories, not just the modeling one, but also the, the Aristotelian and the, and the the, the, the Platonic, uh, uh, there is a you know this extra metaphysical bit that tells you how things are, you know, and that's why given that the law are what they are, you know we have uh, uh, you know we we have we have reality as it is now one, one might think that that's a bad explanation but but uh, can i clarify on the modlinian primitivism so it seems like he has less constraint than we do on the laws sorry given yeah. just um given the present and the past that's less constraint of the whole laws than given the whole space time so if the law just had to be consistent with what actually is there then it seems like modeling has fewer constraint than we do you no, say why do you think the model has more constraint than we do on the form of laws? I mean, he does a form of laws, but not in terms of the complexity or simplicity of laws. Hmm. Well, but I mean, it's, I mean, the constraint he has less constraint uh, uh, in the in the sense that uh, uh, um, you know the, there is the. Uh, so, so does him say for a growing block version of not linear primitivism, we have suggest the, the block itself, the present and the past facts constrain the laws. There's even fewer constraint than the entire space, than the static eternalist state block universe constraining laws, right? So uh, in some sense, we have more constraint than the growing block version of not linear primitivism. Yeah, but you have less reason to take them as primitive, then, right? <laughs> because I mean, like uh, in a sense, you you given that you have the old block, uh, you know, one might ask why then then having also the laws as a, but that's another issue, probably. Sorry, but uh, okay. Yeah, maybe we can talk more about this in the future. I'd love to hear more about yeah. this question. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Thank Next in line, we have uh, Christian. Hey, thank Hi, you. Yeah, hey, hey. Uh, thank you so much uh, for the talk. I really enjoyed it. I, I think it was uh, wonderful. Uh, yet I would like to follow up on uh, Diego Arana's uh, question uh, because I, I have the same worry and I've been thinking about it uh, for the last uh, couple of weeks, uh, reading some philosophy of physics, literature and laws. And it seems to me that uh, especially in philosophy of physics, uh, there is now a trend uh, arguing that go back in time, but a trend arguing uh, for this kind of uh, you know mathematical or logical constraints on the physical world. And uh, many people argue that uh, laws of nature are expressed in terms of mathematical equations, mathematical equations or mathematical truths, logical truths. And then it's, uh, they say, uh, they constrain the physical world, physical possibilities, way the things, uh, ways in which things could be. Uh, but then, uh, when I think of the rest, uh, in the uh, of the rest of the literature, I can easily see that well, philosophers have come up with a number of things, uh, with a number of uh, possible responses. And you mentioned uh, most of them, uh, you know, universals uh, in in early modern natural philosophy. Uh, the God of Christianity and so forth. So now what we are saying is that 
mathematical truths are constraining physical possibilities. So mathematics does something in producing uh, physical, you know, the state of the physical world. Uh, but I don't see how this, uh, how that can uh, be the case. Uh, and if you go that way, then you will need to go ahead and say something about the philosophy of applied mathematics. Uh, you know, you will need to go Pythagorean or Platonist and say how the mathematics causally interact with the world to produce the next stage of the physical world. Um, uh, or maybe not. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I just would like to hear more, uh, you know, from you about that uh, point. Yeah. Jolie, would you like to go first? Yeah, I, I, the question is of this analogy with mathematics, on what level it's supposed to be helpful, since there are probably as many issues related to the nature, I could even perhaps say the metaphysics of mathematics as there is to the nature and the metaphysics of laws. Um, there are probably the controversies about foundations of mathematics are no more likely to go away than controversy about nature of law. Now, so I, I think the analogy has to be understood in a way in which somehow its role doesn't depend upon um, a sharp position on the nature of law. There, what Diego said was, oh, well, look, there are certain views in, uh, in which um, mathematics is not a constraint at all. It's just, it's trivial. Maybe the way you should think about the analogy is what we're saying here is this constraining here, this governing here, which takes place on min p is basically just trivial. You learn, you, you recognize that some simple condition given by a t-shirt formula accounts for the bewildering variety of what we experience in the world. That's it. That's, that's the, that, that could be the, most important discovery in human <laughs> history. If you saw everything following from this simple t-shirt formula, we don't live in the Mandelbrot world, but imagine that we did. Um, would you then want to complain about, you don't understand the nature of which that governs? Maybe that question is a category mistake. Yeah, so um, I agree. And also uh, on this analogy with mathematical laws, we don't think it's kind of a complete analogy. So when we say that um, this one is a response to BB's objection, we don't mean that now we think laws of mathematics and laws of physics explain or govern or produce in the same way. Um, it's not merely a response to a question that what does, does governing require a human or divine agent? And it seems like we don't need it to be. Um, but how mathematical laws govern and how physical laws govern might be different. And we know that the scope are different, access to epistemic access are different. So there must be some difference between how they govern too. Um, but you're right, there is a lot of difficult issues here regarding math, flaws in mathematics, which we don't talk about in this paper, um, but maybe we we'll do in future work. Maybe the most difficult issue here in a certain sense, at least for us, it, this is always a difficult issue for me, is how to find the right word to convey what one has in mind. Mm -hmm. Governing is not the right word, but it, it, does, it does good work for many people, but not for others. It has a lot of in, inappropriate connotations here. Maybe constraining, well, it doesn't have those inappropriate connotations, Maybe somehow it lacks the um of some. If anybody has a suggestion of a better word, I would be I would greatly appreciate that. Right. Yeah. What's crucial for us, the core is that laws are fundamental. The mosaic might be fundamental too, but they stand in some asymmetric relation. Laws governs the mosaic, not vice versa. They say symmetry yeah, is yeah, yeah, I really like what uh, what Sheldon said about the limit that language imposes uh, when you think about laws of nature. Uh, yeah, I think that's exactly right. Uh, the, the words maybe you know a bit are uh, causing a bit of a confusion here. Uh, but what 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 I uh, you know I'm gonna read the paper uh, this weekend or on Monday. I'm really looking forward to that. Uh, but what I would like to avoid is uh, to say that 
uh, physical modality flows from mathematical equations or from mathematical truths. Uh, physical modality flows from physical world, physical systems, uh, and so forth. Yeah, uh, but well, thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah, we don't think it flows from mathematical modalities. It's independent of the modality mathematics. Yeah. Okay, yeah, thank you. Thank you. Fine. Uh, now it's Ken's turn. Hi, Ken. Hi, hi, guys. Uh, Eddie, good to see you again. Uh, hi, good Shelley. Um, great talk. I, of course, I'm, as you know, I'm, I'm all, all on board on this, on this program of yours here. Um, and I really just want to stress that I, I love that how you highlighted the um, uh, action uh, minimization, action extremization, because a lot of people just think of that as a trick to get to the floats, and then they use it, and they get to these dynamical equations and they forgot how they got it in the first place but starting you know extremizing the action as the rule i think is is a much better way uh to think about it but i just wanted to um a couple more examples i'd li like your feedback on you jumped uh the only quantum example you had was the sutherland uh, retrocausal model um so let me float a couple intermediate quantum examples and see if you think this would fit in your framework one would be uh, the original Bohr model of the hydrogen atom, where he he said the angular momentum of the electron has to be a multiple of h bar, right? So I don't know do you consider that as a a constraint? And then uh, that was generalized to um, the Sommerfeld old quantum theory, this this action quantization, and that that to me those kind of seem similar. But what I, I really am curious about is if you've thought about the Feynman path integral in this context and whether you think that falls in this global constraint category or not. That's that's my main question. Well, in the earlier version, um, Sean and I discussed having the final pattern degree as one example. Uh, we took it out in the final version. Maybe Sean, you wanna say something about the final pattern? Yeah, so that's a, that's, a, that's a really great question. Um, I think that both of your examples can Bohr's quantization rule, Feynman path interval, are fit in quite well. Perfectly good possibilities in that as possible laws under mid and p. However, as we all know, one would one wouldn't want to regard the Feynman quantization rule is an adequate physical theory. And I myself have trouble under, would I have trouble understanding um, the Feynman path integral as an adequate physical theory. But I don't wanna say it's not an adequate physical theory because it doesn't meet the requisite of what a law is. No, laws, I wanna have a robust, a, a rich notion of laws which cover all the possibilities. If I, and if I reject the theory, it, for, it should be for, because the theory doesn't work for more basic reasons. Like it doesn't, it's not clear what it says, for example, or it seems too special or whatever. There are all kinds of grounds for rejecting a theory. Saying that it doesn't meet the definition of a law seems too cheap. In the same, same spirit, we say that the Einstein equation can be regarded as a fundamental law, even though it does admit solutions that seem a-causal with CTCs and so on. So Marlin's view, maybe Demers' view, has to reject them as metaphysically impossible. But our view admits them as metaphysically possible, but we might have physical reasons not to embrace them, say, uh, maybe there are extra laws that rule them out, but it is not because the metaphysics of laws that rule them out. So we want to regard Einstein equation as possible candidate law of physics um, it's on a fundamental level. Okay, well, I'd love to talk to you more about why you took the path integral analysis out of your, uh, in fact, if you would care to share that portion you wrote with me, I'd love to, I'd love to see it. <laughs> I think it was only in the outline version. I think we took it up because uh, neither of us um, understood the physical Meaning, uh, or well, yeah, um, no, no, nobody do that. <laughs> uh, how to give a physical ontology of that? Okay, thank you. Thanks. Thank you, mm -hmm. uh, Michelle. Please go ahead. Well, thank you very much for your talk. It was very interesting. It uh, very well delivered. Very clear. Thank you. I enjoyed it very much. 
Uh, I am a philosopher and I am interested in what exists. And I was asking myself if uh, uh, laws, according to you, which are of, of course ontological realities, otherwise they couldn't constrain or govern, are they immanent to the world or are they transcendent to the world? Are they part of the world or are they outside the world? First thing, and if they are inside the world, what are they? I mean, are they properties, uh, facts, substances, whatever? That's uh, perhaps I'm making category mistakes here as uh, Sheldon said, but uh, that's what uh, philosophers usually are interested about, you know, what the nature of the, of the, of the realities. And, you know, and on the other hand, you know, if laws are transcendent, are they platonic forms uh, or things like that? I would look forward to, to, to hearing you on that. I just yeah, have one comment, and I'll let Eddie take care of the rest. As to whether laws are in the world or not, of course, that depends a lot on what you mean by the world. Exactly. They're certainly among the things that exist. And if what if the thing, if the world is constituted what exists, then laws are in the world. No, but you, that you doesn't take help the example. You that much. <laughs> but but you know, you took the, the example of this block, and then the, the laws are outside the block. Well, you can take, of course, the world made up of this block and the laws. I have right. no problem with that. You know, I just want to know what you think. Mm -hmm. I would not want to say that the laws are in the block. I don't think that's maybe the best way to think about it. They exist, but they don't exist as in as in the block. There's that's something right. I would say they transcend. That's track. I my view is that transcendent. I'm not sure what Eddie's is. Right. It's a great question. Um, we, I mean, on the paper version, we say that physical reality can be described by a pair, the block comma the laws. Now for humans, they say the laws are reducible to the block. For us, when we say both the block and the laws are fundamental, they're fundamental ingredients of reality. We don't want to reduce one to the other, even though laws explain the pattern on the mosaic. So for us, um, laws are independent existence. And for us, they are primitive too. So this might be unhelpful, but to say primitive is to say they're fundamental and further unanalyzable. So if I give you a deeper answer to say, laws are made out of A, B, and C, that means I'm being consistent. To say they're primitive means it is where I stop. Laws are laws. And to know what laws are, you know how we, so this following uh, modeling's uh, approach in the metaphysical physics, you see how we infer things from laws. You see how we use law to support explanations kind of factuals, predictions and the like, and that's how we use laws. But you say what laws are in a deeper sense, there is no deeper analysis if our view is right. If mean P is right, there is no deeper analysis of laws into something else. Well, of I, course, I if there is more compelling reason to reduce them further in universal dispositions, I'm happy to entertain them, but I don't know if there's any reason to reduce them further. <laughs> I want to just follow, you know, the leading science right. practice that uh, we start from laws and with laws, use law to explain, use law to predict. Yeah. Okay. But you know, you, they could be, they could be facts that are not analyzable. That's not that would that wouldn't be a contradiction. What would be a contradiction is to reduce laws to something else. That would right. be a contradiction. That would be an analysis. But uh, you could say that there are facts or there are forms. It seems to me that what you are getting to is that laws are forms. Those are forms. They can be immanent or transcendent to the world, but they act and they, they impinge, they impose what uh, is going on uh, in, the, in this block. You know? But you, I think you, as a philosopher, you must say a little more on what they are ontologically. You cannot rest satisfied with saying that they are just uh, primitive, analyzed, analyzed, and fundamental. It seems to me, but uh... yeah, good. Maybe there are further choice points about what we should say: transcendence, imminence. Although I sometimes doubt whether the uh, um, uh, the categories um, are, uh, you know, direct relevant to the debates of laws. They are more relevant to debates of uh, properties and universals and from Plato and Aristotle, but for laws of nature, it seems a bit more foreign to this issue. But I, I agree that there can be more to be said here. 
Well, but if they are realities, you know, the, that's uh, I think the immanence and transcendence is a relevant question. They're real. They are not, you know. Well, then, but you must you must uh, have them to be real. I think. But thank Sean, you very much. Asking very uh, deep questions. I don't think um, maybe it's the case that the level of our concern about laws is not quite not quite that deep. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. Uh, thanks. Uh, let me very quickly follow up on what Michelle said, because this is something that I had in mind while you were presenting, uh, Eddie. So the idea is that uh, these uh, laws in uh, your uh, framework are external to what is uh, constrained. So in particular, they are external to space and time. Um, now, isn't this uh, some sort of platonism in disguise? Because laws uh, are not things in space and time. So it seems there are something akin to abstract entities. And then uh, the things constrained seems uh, to, to be um, instances of this general constraint, which is the law. So isn't this something that is basically what you call uh, Platonist uh, um, reductionism or something very similar to that? I'm happy to plead guilty to Platonism. I'm not sure about <laughs> Eddie. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm a nominalist, but I think NIMPI is compatible with both Platonism and nominalism probably. Um, I don't think it is a version of Platonic reductionism because we're not trying to reduce law to anything else like properties like having mass M or having acceleration A. So um, the paradigm example of Platonic reductionism is to understand you know, the terms of the laws I have because I may, it is referring to some universal properties that things have, um, but we don't want to do that. So at least that's the difference between our view and Armstrong, Tully and Dresty. But uh, one can say that there is some platonic element in a sense, there is something existing that's not in or at or a uh, when of space time. And that's, I think, uh, true. But this probably transcends the usual platonic uh, uh, and concrete abstract distinction. Because here, the abstracta, or namely the laws, do you have causal powers? Well, I mean, we derive causal power from the laws on our view. We think of causation as being understood standable in terms of. Uh, in some cases, in the laws, um, it's action on the whole space time, even though it's not fundamental. So, uh, on this view, it seems like this transcends the usual category of abstracta as kind of abstracted away from the particulars. So, here is one thing that's abstracted away, namely the, the entire space time. And other things that are abstracted away are possible space times, but not all of them are concrete, only one concrete thing. So, it feels different from the case where you have cups. Abstract away being a cup from the concrete cups on the table. So here we have one big space time governed by the law. It's not like we have five concrete space times governed by the same law. We have one actual space time governed by uh, the actual law. So it does feel different from the usual case of concrete and abstracta. Maybe we need more categories here. Maybe law like abstracta or abstract law or something like that. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Thank you very much. Um, Thank you. So uh, Tyler, it's your turn. Great, thank hey, you. Hello, hello Eddie. Hey, it's Hi, good to see you. Uh, thanks for a great talk. Um, ah. My question is actually like it, it fits nicely with the discussion that's just been going on. Uh, but I want to start by asking something about simplicity. So the notion of simplicity is language relative. Uh, this features very prominently in discussions of human best systems accounts. Um, and David Lewis's solution to this is to say, oh, well, you know, we can't just say that laws have to be simple. We have to say that they're simple when they are stated in the correct sort of language. And the correct sort of language is one whose primitive predicates refer to natural properties. Um, there are different views about how exactly we're supposed to interpret it. But basically, like one of the important takeaways is that we're not allowed to create weird gerrymandered predicates mm -hmm. uh, in our theorizing. If we did that, we could take 
arbitrarily complex systems and just sort of whisk up a neat little predicate and then say, you know, like everything in the system satisfies this predicate and then you'd have a beautifully simple law, but that doesn't seem right. So right. we need some kind of constraint on languages. So the question then for you is this, do you require a distinction between natural and non-natural properties? And if so, does that push your account in the direction of something like uh, the dretsky tuli armstrong view, which posits oh, universal? Yeah, so regarding the first one, um, I think we have degree of naturalness as one of the epistemic guides to laws too. So we are balancing not just simplicity, but also other virtues, strength, fit, and naturalness, but not absolute naturalness, not perfect naturalness, but requires something like the more natural, the better, other things being equal. Um, so we do want to have restriction on language, but it's more like kind of a degree notion of restriction. Um, and so we do, we can avoid the problem of trivialization, say Lewis case of raw X, FX. Um, but in terms of pushing that towards um, the DTA account, I'm not quite sure, maybe, um, I'm not quite sure. I think that um, this does not commit us to the existence of universals, right? Yes, uh, for Lewis, it can be a class nominalist of properties. Um, it can be a, a high order um, classes of classes, right? So it doesn't commit us to Platonism of properties or universals. But it does seem to require like, this distinct between natural and unnatural or less natural classes. Um, again, this might not be <clears throat> something that's ontological, right? Just like simplicity may not be ontological requirement for laws, this might just be a methodological or epistemic guide for discovering laws. Why it is truth conducive or law conducive? Well, it's a good question, a big question everyone has to answer. It's not a particular our view. Yeah, thanks very much. That's helpful. Yeah, thank you, Tyler. Thanks. Uh, next in line, we have Nino. Hi, Eddie. Hi, Nino. Nice talk. Thank you. And as I wrote to you immediately after you sent me the paper that I share reviews that Shelley and you presented in that paper. Still, I have some puzzle, I will tell you soon. But first, let me say something uh, maybe a bit too sim <clears throat> uh, simplistic, uh, I don't know exactly the word, but say, can I summarize your project in these terms? Oh, let's try as philosopher to understand what is the nature of, uh, of this kind of object that physicists call physical laws without metaphysics standing on the way of uh, deciding what is good and what is not good. It's not, I mean, I, I'm too rough in, 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 in expressing. So in this sense, I understand that sometimes the words are not uh, the right ones, or maybe one would, would like to have better words, but depends very much on the environment. I remember many years ago when I <clears throat> gave a talk on Bohemian mechanics and uh, Statitz Psilos was in the audience. Later, I had a, a nice conversation with him. And he considered himself, at least 10 years ago, I don't know now, a Jungian, but he was so happy about the word uh, governing. I mean, that the wave function governing is governing the motion of particle in Bohemian mechanics. So sometimes it's just a question of, uh, of uh, some environments in which uh, some words, uh, people are so allergic to, to, to the words. I mean, that's, uh, so I will not take it. So, I mean, that, that's, uh, so the first question was whether that was uh, too, too rough, my summary. And the second is, since I share similar views, I have a problem, Shelley knows, I would like to fit uh, also the notion of uh, uh, stochastic laws inside the scheme. And, uh, and this is, I find, uh, I, I don't think one should exclude that. It should be a way to... Yeah. That's one concern. The other one, and Shelley knows very well, many years ago when I was more in philosophy than now, in which I'm, I'm much less than once, I worried about stuff like conceptual relativity, ontological relativity, problem raised by, by Quine originally, and then and by Putnam. And so when you say that when in your talk that uh, if we think of the lower selecting a subset of all the possibilities, 
of uh, ontolo of, of histories of, of, of yeah. your ontology, and there should be a unique way. I, I still have uh, uh, well the concern whether it's really so, or maybe there is some Kantian aspect in which uh, we have to live with, and such uniqueness maybe is not there. Okay, that, that's all I have to say. In any case, I mean, basically no question because I, I share most of what you say. Yeah. So my, my impression is that the, the rough summary is in the same spirit as our project. Um, There's a very much naturalistic metaphysics guided by scientific practice and um, hopefully informed by scientific practice. And uh, we think that there are lots of distinctions we can make but the distinction should not be metaphysical prohibitions about the form of laws, but should be methodological criteria we evaluate laws are. The second question about the counting aspect. I'm not sure what Shelley thinks, but I do think there might be a count, well, a counting interpretation of the project. The, the, way, the way we think about realist laws guided by simplicity and so on, we discover them might be due to us, but um, I, I want to kind of, um, so I myself on uh, some days are sympathetic to uh, Kantianism, but some days not. Uh, today, I don't want to be a Kantian and say that uh, the world is the way it is. It's mind independent. And we discover the world and it's a miracle we can. It's kind of a wonder, uh, one marvelous thing that by our inductive practice and abduction and all of this that we can arrive at the true principles governing nature. And there's no guarantee we can be right. And we might be finding one of many competing hypotheses that are all empirically adequate, but we arrive at the wrong laws, there's a possibility. I think a realist should be happy to live with the possibility of fallibilism. I think it should be a badge of honor. We are not guaranteed to find the truth. So even though it might be conceptually relative, that in the uncertainty of what the laws are, we can still say, you know, uh, trusting the press we have, we are not guaranteed to find the truth in the end, even when we're completely rational. And we are not rational in that sense either. So that's more something to you. Yeah, but Shelley knows what I'm talking about. Once we played the game of uh, formulating uh, Bovio mechanics in uh, right. thousand ways, no, thousand is too much, but at least 20 or 25 yeah. different ways of different, okay. Yeah, I think, um, you know, I think um, in Eddie's talk, he gestured to this very question when he talked about the difference between the um, set of possible histories of mm -hmm. the universe and the law itself. And, and he raised the question of equivalence between formulations of laws. You, you could formulate um, different equations, different ways of, 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 of capturing the same set of possibilities some of those formulations you might somehow think of as not the same law, but some you might think of as the same, but how do you tell whether they're the same or not? I think, I don't, I don't Eddie did not try to answer that question because it'd be very difficult to answer it. Yeah. It's a new project. Maybe it's one Eddie's working on already. Yes. Yeah. And as far as the issue of, of um, understanding stochastic laws, yes, Eddie was very clear that we're very unclear about that. <laughs> That's one of the biggest puzzles. So we, right. I think I can say we totally agree with your your comments, both positive and negative. Right. Okay. Some stochastic laws too. See you soon. Um, okay. Yeah. On the stochastic laws, so in a GRW version, we might think of the law as typicality constraint on the whole space-time history. Yes. Yes. Um, then what is typicality doing in the theory? Is it constraining, or is it placing something extra than physical possibility? So both options are open. Uh, now I prefer the stronger view in which what's possible is what's typical and what's typical is what's possible. It's stronger than what we usually think. Usually we think that the typical class, the typical trajectory, typical histories are a proper subset of the possible histories. But I now think that perhaps it's not entirely incoherent to say that the typicality law constrains by giving us this class of physical possibilities. And this is what we realize a strong version of Cornell's principle, right? That's Believe right, what that's, that's, that's where, I, where I wanted to arrive. That, that you need the, a, a strong version of a Cornell principle somehow on the universal level, otherwise. That's right. So why, why, why not just think that possibility is just given by typicalities? Yeah, that, that's what I, 
always uh, uh, good. So, so that, I already, that, that's been always my idea. Okay. But, and I, that, but, but uh, this is where, where I see. Uh, since I, I'm uh, had, I, I'm uh, in a in a much uh, better situation than you because I'm not a philosopher, and uh, as a physicist, I'm fine. I mean, for me, it's a law. I mean, I can think of a stochastic law. But if you try to sharpen this in metaphysical terms, I understand that that's maybe difficult. So that, that's, uh, you should continue to work on this. It's just that I see this as the beginning of a project. In, uh, right, right. Yeah, there are always, there are certain things that, there are certain things that you only worry about when you put your philosopher's hat on. <laughs> <laughs> right. Okay, that's all, okay. Thanks, thank you now. Thanks. Uh, now it's Joanna's turn. Hi, Joanna. Uh, hi, uh, thank you. Mm. Uh, my question is um, whether uh, your motivation uh, for regarding the notion of laws of nature as primitive uh, is uh, that um, you find the uh, particular existing reductive approaches uh, unsatisfactory, or maybe you have some more general argument that it's better uh, to treat the notion of loss of nature uh, as primitive and not uh, seek for a uh, reduction of it to something else. Yeah. It's a good question. Thank you, Joanna. So I think both. Um, I think uh, we have both reasons in mind. One is the negative reason uh, that we have uh, maybe puzzles about or um, uh, a certain kind of elements in platonic reductionism, human reductionism, or esteem reductionism. And but moreover, we think that um, it seems that scientific practice give us reason to preferring primitivism of certain sort that uh, in science, we're not, um, at least now in modern physics, we're not so much interested in the fine detailed nature of things, the power of dispositions or universals. More, we're thinking about global laws of the entire space time, not particular laws of this object or my horse or my cat or my cup, but something like the entire space time, including all the horses, all the cats and all the cups. Um, I think this way, then, um, it seems much less natural to think in terms of starting from dispositions or even universals. And we think that human reductionism is somewhat in conflict with scientific practice. That there are cases where we have modeling or uh, consideration in science that we think about non-supervenience. The same mosaic in two different possible worlds compatible with different laws. And that's in con contradiction with human supervenience. So, um, yeah, I think both reasons are what we have in mind. I might go maybe a bit further and say something which maybe is not very clear and it's profoundly unhelpful, but so I apologize. But I, I mean, I'm inclined to say, and this is how it feels to me, that while the laws are quite distinct in some sense from the concrete physical reality, it is the laws themselves which have more oomph than the concrete physical reality. Uh, Lev, it's your turn. Hi, Lev. Oh, Lev, let me Hello. address the question you raised in the chat box first. Let me say uh, that I don't say that in the paper. It's more a rhetorical response to Helen Bibby's. What was in the chat box, Eddie? So Lev says, uh, I find it curious that Eddie finds that it's obvious that about half the population in the world who believe in God are wrong, that the laws are not made by a divine agent. <laughs> it's not intended to be conveyed. It's, I try to convey this rhetorical way that trying to summarize a way of thinking about laws in which um, they're not governed by human or divine agents, then how should we respond to it? I'm not endorsing this particular line of thinking. Hope that clarifies the chat. Okay, anyway, this was a comment, not, not, not a question. Uh, I understand that you accept the idea of block universe, if I'm... And, um, you know, for me, uh, laws are relations in this block universe, and maybe for you too. And the word constraint 
at least in my understanding of English, it tells that there are some range of possible relations. And for me, it's strange. There are definite relations. They are not strange. I mean, there is one, I believe in many words, doesn't matter, but there is one universe and uh, there are definite, const are definite relations. So to call them constraint, when frequent, frequently constraint, it just take about range, sounds strange for me. Another thing which I was uh, somewhat surprised that you uh, uh, said about F equal MA, Schrenger equation, Dirac equation, and said that this is kind of a time-directed load. Um, for me, it looks like there is no any time direction in this load. They are, work well to future and to past exactly in the same way. Only like GRW, if you want to make some stochastic loads, they might have time direction. Maybe the time direction, if you add to lows, but you kind of said that well, this is your intention to add initial boundary condition as a low. But this sounds uh, very strange. You, you talk about simplicity. Initial condition, it's what exists in this block universe. It's, it's, it's not simple, it's, it's, it's extremely complicated. So you cannot say everything which exists is a low. Never mind in which time slate time slice. So I think it's enough. So left second question. Um, uh, we didn't say that. We did not say that F equal MA is time directed. We say that it is permissible to have a time directed interpretation. So people like modeling or other primitivists or other non-humans might want to interpret this law's direct equation, joining equation as time directed productive equations. Um, we're not saying that we hold that interpretation. Okay, just clarify. Okay. So um, we don't disagree with you on that point. Um, regarding um, the first point on um, definite relations. So um, even for many worlds, we say that the Schrodinger equation is not compatible with the actual world, right? The Schrodinger equation is compatible with many different multiverses. And the range of possibilities, just basically the range of solutions compatible with the Schrodinger equation. No, not possibilities. All are actual. There is no, no possibilities in many worlds. Everything is actual. Possibilities are in some other interpretation. Everything actual. You mean all, the, you, at Lev, yes. are you saying that if you consider that all possible solutions to Schrodinger's equation correspond to equally actual histories of the universe? They all actual, they not equal because they may, might have different measure of existence. But all mm -hmm. uh, all solution, uh, no, not solution. Every okay. time I go to experiment and I have non-zero amplitude, everything happens. All others do not exist. Only there is particular initial condition and there are particular quantum experiment in the universe. And all non-zero amplitude um, the outcomes happen. And nothing else. But Lev, there's a, I think the way you're putting this con conflates or seems to conflate or Max Tegmark's level three, which is the level of many worlds, parallel worlds, and Max Tegmark's level four. I, but well, when maybe, I read maybe, the, maybe you're talking about what you sound like sounds like level three and a half. <laughs> I mean, I'm, you, for you, there's an actual wave function of the whole universe which has evolved. There's one such wave function. According to Schrodinger's equation, there might be many different ones, but one of them is the correct one. Each That correct one for you describes many worlds. Yes. But there's also one that doesn't describe any worlds because it's not the correct solution, not the actual physical solution that is actually relevant to our world. Our, Multiverse in your terms. There is multiverse. One word in this multiverse is the one which uh, now we are in this Zoom session. I'm pretty sure that there are some parallel worlds in which uh, no humans are present. Yeah. Plausible. I don't know. It might happen. It's not clear. But anyway, just to, to solve the solution, some other solution, mathematical solution. Possible solutions are not of interest. There is only one universal wave function and it has uh, many words. 
One of yeah. them we have here. I don't think, I think that there, there was no, I don't think there's any real disagreement here on this matter, just confusion in language. Okay, okay, but still, if, if I'm uh, about constraint, you ask about semantics. If the yeah, constraint yeah, means no, that the range and you're of different possibilities. word, relation. Um, I have, I myself would have problems with that word, but again, it, it, it maybe the, 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 what the difference between us here might be simply how we react to a word and not being, not being, being not very substantive difference at all. That was the last point about the uh, initial condition, trying to make it as a law. No, no, but Eddie never said the initial condition itself is a law. He said you, we, there are possible laws that concern initial conditions, like the past hypothesis. But for that to be, for, and I think most people would agree that your the past hypothesis would have to be have been formulated in a sufficiently simple way for it to be acceptable as a law. Just to specify the complicated initial condition of the universe, nobody would take that seriously as a law. Now, if you can, if you can specify some extremely simple initial condition, maybe something that Roger Penrose has suggested, if it's simple enough, that could be the law. Like, well, let me stop there. I mean, suppose suppose some initial condition of the universe corresponded to some extremely nice distribution of stuff in the universe. Something, a distribution of stuff in the universe you, which you could write down on one line. If you say, no, that couldn't possibly be the case. Think about what the one line description of the Mandelbrot set can accomplish. But really there is one initial condition, particular one. Now, uh, if this one, give it description and this is a story, why try to, you, you say it's important to have, uh, there are some, to call it a low, why it is this way and other way, it sounds strange for me. If, it would be strange unless there was a purpose to do so, unless it really explained something. And so if you, if, as I know you do, Lev, if you think that you don't need the past hypothesis to understand stuff, the past hypothesis is a law, then you, then you react the way you do. Many people really are convinced that unless one says something even more, much more exotic, you really do not need to posit the past hypothesis as a law. Well, you've got that possibility from the point of view of Min P. Your disagreement here is you is with whether with whether you need such you need such a law on initial conditions. It's a semantic disagreement. I I need past hypothesis. Uh, it's hard for me to call, to call it a law. To law, it's this relation between in a block universe between the facts. And what, has, what is in a block universe, I don't want to call it a law. Well, think about the three-dimensional block, which is the initial state in the initial stage of the universe, and yes. think about relations on that. Yes, this is exactly, this is how God or whoever nature put initial condition. I don't, I don't think he had a law. He decided to put what he wanted. Well, did putting take place at the initial time or did putting take place at, over the whole block? It, putting is putting, I mean, but, but these it, are metaphors. Yes, exactly. So if, will you consider the current situation of the universe as a law? Hard to say. It. it fulfills some properties, uh, Gauss law, whatever. It should fulfill. Uh, so, but so maybe is this what you call a law? That, that, I would. I would find it acceptable as a law, something of that form. I wouldn't want to rule it out. May I add something very, 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 very brief? Go ahead. Go ahead. Lev, I don't understand your problem really. It's not just semantic. Uh, one of the first to say that we need that additional law was Feynman. And it goes back to my idea that uh, philosophers should make sense of what we call laws in physics. And Feynman was one of the first to say that uh, to make sense of everything, we need that additional law about uh, initial conditions. So it doesn't seem to me just a question of semantics. Sorry, I stopped. I mean, sorry for. Uh, 
Okay. We can talk more about this later. Okay, uh, okay but I think I, I got answers. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Tomasz. Uh, okay, thank you. I, I promise to be very, very brief. I have a quick question regarding one particular uh, detail in your presentation. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, I think I've noticed in one of your slides this comment that according to your conception, uh, loss can be considered as changing in time. And I was wondering, what does that this exactly mean? And how can you actually reconcile this idea with this general broad idea that loss, according to your conception, are general constraints on the entire sort of block universe? How can you reconcile this with the idea of loss changing in over time? <laughs> question Shelley would you like to go first yeah I think just I think and what Eddie was conveying there was the possibility that you know, that one could have time dependent explicitly time dependent equations of motion and you would one might call that a law which varies with time you could also say, no, there was nothing which that's, but the meaning would be just that trivial thing. There's an explicit time dependence in the equation of motion. From a, from a broader perspective, you say there's still only one law. It's just that it, you know, it has this extra feature. I think you have something deeper and more puzzling in mind, and, but I don't think we meant anything that Eddie, Eddie meant anything more than what I just said. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so one example we have is say, think about the big crunch, uh, the universe that one side can be governed by classical Newtonian mechanics of point particles, and the other side can be governed by Bohmian mechanics. You can think the law is basically one law that says the laws will change at t, or the, the, the principle will change from this to this at t. We can think there are two laws in which um, one law governs this part of space time, one law governs this part of space time. It's, not so different from the case of the past hypothesis governing this initial slice of time. If you think that laws can be particular about time, just like laws can be particular about space, then you can have laws governing pockets of space time, not entire space times. Generalization idea that laws govern space times. Okay, thank you. But I, I think one small problem that I have with this explanation is that it, it seems to me that it requires that the law has to would have to make reference to particular points of time, which kind of like goes against this uh, intuition that law should not uh, include any uh, sort of specific or uh, individual or, or sort of like, you know, uh, non-general uh, descriptions, like, like, you know, reference to particular or individual places, uh, moments or, or, or objects or, or, you know, whatever. So that, 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 that's kind of like the reason why I feel a little bit uneasy about the idea of, of laws changing. But, but my understanding is, of course, like, you know, given the earlier comment by Sheldon, I think that, that if, if you just basically want to accommodate this time dependence as a certain mathematical sort of rule of your of your law, then, of course, I have no objections to that. It's, it's, it's still a law. It's still a law. So. Well, as I think I agree with you. I, I, I think the relevant distinction here is between is is the relevant question is why does one dismiss a particular law? One reason for dismissing it is it doesn't meet the metaphysics of laws. It's, it's, it's not a law according to my view of law. Another reason for dismissing it, quite a different reason, I suppose, is that no, that, 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 that meets the definition of law, what a law has to be, but I don't think it's a very good law. I don't think a good law should be like that. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Uh, let's go back to Diego. Um, yeah, uh, this is question is kind of, you probably got similar questions, uh, I think, here, but uh, I'm, I'm still going to ask this anyway. Um, so just consider two duplicate words, not, not two duplicate words, just two worlds uh, which have different laws but which on all uh, non-nomic aspects, they're the same. <clears throat> uh, so like if you're in one world, you have a, a absolutely no way of knowing uh, that you are in that world as opposed to the other world. Um, and consider one world like us, like, like our world, uh, which is a duplicate of that 
of, of our world in that respect, but we have like super, super complicated laws. Like uh, if, if, if that were to happen, we would have absolutely no way of knowing uh, that that was the case. Uh, so this is like, I, I, I take that to be sort of like an epistemic problem for, for the view. Um, I don't think it's a problem actually, it's a problem for everyone. It's a problem of induction. No. I mean- But even yeah, for humans, you can have duplicate even, within your warm of space-time. But um, outside that warm of space-time that you occupy, you can change a mosaic, whatever you like. So there's no way, right? So you have to process something about the mosaic as, as a whole, even though you have no direct access to the microscopic detail of everywhere in space-time. So there's a gap too from humanism. So both humanism and non-humanism probably have to assume that there are simplistic physical laws. They are helping us to bridge a gap between what we know, what we have evidence for and what the reality is. And actually both are going to via the laws of nature. Even for humans, the nature of the mosaic itself is theoretical. It's not directly subject to us. You have only medium-sized dry goods in your evidence. You have to use laws to infer what really exists. In your right, but but uh, but, uh, outside the space place. but but I also th I, I think that uh, if, if you just like hold this thing that laws are separate from the mosaic, you have to posit like an extra thing, which is that the relationship between the laws and the mosaic is simple, or something like that, right? Well, uh, which is not not just the mosaic a, is simple. Epistemically, it's uh, not going to be an additional problem. I think it's the same kind of posture that we might make on humanism and on non-humanism. It's so a simplicity of laws for non-humans. Simplicity of law. In, Encodes expression about what a mosaic should be nice. So nice and mosaic correspond to the best system in some sense being nice given our current evidence, which is finite and limited. So there's also limitation on how we should know what the mosaic on humanism. Well, I think on Barry's view is different because package deal account kind of there's difference in that, right? Mm -hmm. Given how limited human beings are, it's amazing we can know anything, <laughs> right? Great. So let's take the last question from Barry. Hey, hi, Sherry. Hi, hi Eddie. Hi, Barry. I, I was actually there, even though you didn't see me there. I was on the subway watching you on my iPad. Um, so that was great. I enjoyed it a lot. Thank I you. have a question, a couple of questions on behalf of Yumian, unsurprisingly. And one is close to what Diego was just asking. I'm not sure what these constraints are, but I thought what was behind Diego's question was that look, there could be any kind of constraint. You haven't told us anything about the metaphysics of constraints. There might be a world in which the only thing that's constrained is Eddie's eyeglasses, that these with certain kinds of eyeglasses. Another world with other kinds of things. Now, if you believe in constraints like that, the problem for indu of induction is much worse for you because you got to make inductions about these constraints besides for anything else. I think that was one of the things that was been getting out with respect to Eddie's, um, with respect to Diego's uh, discussion. Um, so one question then is, how can you tell where there are really constraints and where there aren't constraints? After all of these worlds of all sorts, with all sorts of constraints, a companion question is this. Suppose, as I think you would, that there could be a world just like one of your worlds in which things are constrained in the nice way you think by, I don't know, general relativist equations or something like that. There'll be another world just like that one, except the constraints aren't there. The scientists in this other world, assuming you're willing to grant that there could be scientists in this other world, would go about doing their science in exactly the same way as the scientists in the world with these constraints. The puzzle that I have is what exactly are these constraints adding other than making you feel good making you feel like something is keeping things in place and when you really stop and think about it is it really anything keeping anything in place <laughs> um shelly would you like to go first i would only say i don't think it's such a bad thing to feel good <laughs> well, it depends what makes you feel good 
When I think about these constraints, I start feeling, you know, constrained. Oh, okay, so maybe that's the essential difference. <laughs> Eddie, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Barry. There is a tradition that humans treat as non-humans for race, um, for this extra epistemological obstacle from knowing the laws, knowing the gnomic from the non-gnomic. And this is discussed in Ehrman and Roberts' two-part paper, PPR, mm -hmm. um, a, few, a decade ago. And I think um, the argument um, is somewhat, uh, is interesting argument, but I think it's ultimately mistaken. So the reason is, um, I think many non-humans I pointed out, actually, uh, Tyler Hildebrand is one of them, that uh, in one of his uh, recent manuscripts. So the reason is that um, there is a problem of induction for everyone there's a gap for everyone. From our limited evidence of what we can observe directly, what's in front of me, and what we have in common, what we can share with each other, there's very little we can directly infer about physical reality, whether it's a mosaic or mosaic plus laws. Now, um, the reason humans feel better in some sense <laughs> about epistemic security is that um, there is a line of thinking that our evidence consists in only human facts. What actually exists? Location of cups and tables, location of particles and fields. As we know, that's not the case. We don't have direct access to location of particles and fields. We have competing hypotheses about you know, what, how particles are moving, how fields are behaving, hypothesis about what mosaics like. And also even for humans, uh, given very liberal understanding of evidence, we still have no access, direct access to what is outside of our light coma, what is right in front of the future, right in the past. So we have this inference problem anyway for humans, humanism too. And the, the only way, the principle way I can, I think can bridge the, the gap is to say, on humanism say, we assume that the best system is somewhat simple, compared with our current evidence so far. And that is in addition to the best in the kind of laws that says given the mosaic, the laws are simpler than the mosaic. No, there's something in addition. It says, give our current evidence. The mosaic, the mosaic should be such that it can be summarized by some simple law, even though we do not have direct access to what the mosaic is like. And from the simple mass best system, hypothetical best system, we can infer what the mosaic is like. So even for humans, what the mosaic is like, it's a theoretical thing we infer to, not something we direct observe at all in anyone. <laughs> Uh, is something we have to um, you know, use something to bridge a gap. And that gap is bridged by the simplest so, physical law. Eddie, possible. I think you completely misconstrued what I was saying. I wasn't claiming that the Jungian has a solution to the problem of induction. Not at all. I agree with something that you said over and over again. That ain't, that's the one thing I know for sure that's been a definite result in philosophy is that uh -huh. there's no solution to the problem of induction. It's rather what I was saying is that the non human is adding something else to his metaphysics, which isn't really doing any scientific work. It's just making you feel good. It makes Shelley feel good. But I think when you really reflect on it, it ought not. It's, it's a, it's a non-explainer. There's something, it, it, what it's really doing, I mean, to be frank with you, although it's a long story, is that, you know, those people who studied the history of the concept of laws knows that the concept originated had this theological origin and laws was supposed to be, as Newton says, God's volitions. And once God went away, you wanted something to keep things in place. And that's what the non humans want. No, that's not what I want. <laughs> that's what you, you know, sometimes it takes a little psychoanalysis, Shelley. Before Keeping you... things in place. No, I don't think I, I like better putting things on top of things. <laughs> Okay. Right. So sorry, maybe I misunderstood you, Barry. I thought there were two parts of the question. One is the epistemic kind of uh, access. The other yes, is- It wasn't because the human is, is better, the human can solve the problem of induction. It's just that the non-human is a bit worse off because he has more to make inductions about, namely these constraints, which could be- well, anyway. So it's connected to the first question, I think. It's not that we induct into the mosaic. We induct it first to the laws on humanism and on non-humanism whatever is governing or summarizing. So it's the same thing we're trying to infer to from our finite evidence. And the, the human is going to use that, that system to scientifically account for the mosaic or give us 
epistemic mm. constraint on the mosaic is like is indirect. So the hemia has an additional kind of inference about what the mosaic is like um, and that we can catch on terms of scientific, scientific explanation. The non-humans to say this is basically a compatibility relation. The mosaic has been compatible with the laws. Um, but what we're trying to get to at the first stage, humans and non-humans, mean P, it's just the laws of nature, the simple laws. And the metaphysical part, whether it's summarizing or governing, is I think secondary, secondary to scientific discovery. Um, and we can debate about whether it is um, um, whether we should be a human or non-human about that. I'm not sure where we are quite now in this discussion, but since we've been talking about this for years and years and years, I we can stop at this point. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Barry. Uh, so, Eddie and Shelley, do you have any concluding remarks in light of this uh, very nice discussion that we had? Well, in light of the discussion, no, but in, let's just say, let's pray for our world. <laughs> and, then, and, and also, uh, thank you all for the comments and questions. I do think that there are lots of open issues to work out here, including simplicity, uh, induction, explanation, um, the one that Bear raised and Diego raised. And they're all very important questions. I think it will keep us uh, in discussion for the next few decades. So look forward to the discussions. Hopefully, hopefully after pandemic and in person again. Oh.